didn't study talking about uh, celebration lectures. I wasn't too sure what these involve, and I did ask him, what should I talk about? Uh, and he didn't give me any pointers. I asked David Russell, who has been my long-standing collaborator, what should I talk about? He offered something, but I really didn't get the gist of what I should talk about. <laughs> so I could only think of uh, one person who you know, could reliably give me some directions. So I called my daughter. I said, <laughs> um, I'm giving a celebration lecture. What should I talk about? And she said, Dad, it's simple. Uh, just tell your story. So I said, how do I tell my story? She said, just wait. I'll send you some photographs, and then you can tell your story. <laughs> so I think I'm hoping that this, uh, this lecture will give you some flavor of my life to date and why I do what I do. Uh, at present. So this is the other one I'll follow. Um, I think Malawi has got two sides. Uh, and I'll briefly discuss those two sides because they're important in uh, the direction that I will take uh, during my talk. Uh, and then I'll tell you how I got here, uh, why I do what I'm doing now. Uh, I'll talk about our science, you know, my group science, uh, and then I'll place special emphasis on uh, our efforts to develop future science leaders in Malawi but also uh, on the African continent. And eventually I'll give you, um, you know, a, a summary of what I think our strategy will be going forward. So, a lot of you, uh, or a lot of people outside Malawi, when they hear the word Malawi, the first thing that comes to mind is a poor country in Africa, uh, probably a, a second from the bottom uh, of uh, the poorest states uh, in the world. I mean, that is true to some extent, but actually Malawi is much more than that. Um, we are a small nation, yes. Uh, you know, it's a small country, um, 180,000 square kilometers. Uh, our population is rising, uh, and uh, it's, there's no sign that it's going to slow down uh, anytime soon. But if you look at our life expectancy, that is going up. I mean, an average of about 64 uh, years. Now, if you look back to uh, the early 2000s, when HIV was really a menace in, in Malawi, uh, the life expectancy was around 40 years. So in the last uh, 20 years or so, we have made great strides in taming that you know, epidemic of HIV in Malawi. And you can just look at the numbers, uh, because new infections have dropped by about 31%. Uh, deaths from uh, HIV or AIDS-related illnesses have gone down by about 55% since 2010. So there is a lot of hope. Uh, the prevalence of HIV has steadily come down. Uh, it's now about 9.2%. And for those of you who've been reading the literature, I mean, it was about 17% a few years ago. However, there are several challenges. If you look at the doctor uh, uh, you know, population ratio or the nurse midwife population ratio, we're still lagging behind. So probably 0 0.02 doctors per every uh, thousand uh, population. And the nursing, the nursing ratio is poor as well. Under five mortality, we've done good work on that. I think that's steadily coming down as well, which is very encouraging. Uh, but we're still losing uh, a lot of uh, young moms who are dying because of being pregnant. And that is sad, because uh, we really need to understand what is causing that. But if you look on the flip side, Malawi is actually a very rich country, uh, in my view, and it's got enormous talent. Uh, but Malawi, like most of Africa, uh, is very, very, well, not very good at identifying talent and really exploiting that talent to its maximum. Um, and I think we need to find a way of addressing that deficit. Um, so Malawians are really funny people, but that humor sometimes just, just doesn't come through. You know, when I read that, you know, this guy was trying, trying to tell a story about the property, property man. He couldn't say them uh, loudly, but he had to put them out uh, somehow for people to read. Um, and uh, the bird is in this room. This is, I got this from David Russell. Uh, you know, beautiful uh, nature, uh, you know, birds, uh, wildlife. But more importantly, uh, you know, the people are just really, really generous people and really nice people. So you can look at the poor side that Malawi is known to be, but I tend to focus on the more positive side that Malawi is and what Malawi can be uh, in terms of developing and you know, harnessing the talent that we have uh, to get the best out of this one. So having said that, how did I get here? I'm using that background because that's really what has informed what I'm doing now. So this was me uh, when I was studying Form 1. <laughs> so, uh, this was 
because my daughter's idea of uh, <laughs> <laughs> so she fished out these photographs from uh, you know an old album that we have at home. But this was me uh, in Form One at our secondary school. Um, uh, and when I got to our secondary school, you know, I was just like any other student studying Form One. I wasn't too sure what I was gonna I was going to do uh, with my life. But even at that early stage, I met two people who began to change my life. The first was Mr. Nkande, who was uh, a physical science teacher. He was a great guy. It was two years after uh, uh, coming out of Chancellor College, and he was an enormous uh, physical science teacher. He really you know, taught us very well. I enjoyed physical science very much. The other one was Mr. Mwanza, who was a biology teacher. He was extremely good as well. So I loved the sciences, even from Form 1. But the guy who really uh, uh, sent me crazy was uh, uh, you know, a helicopter pilot for the Malawi Defense Force. And this was the time when um, the Malawi Defense Force had just started an air wing. They bought helicopters and uh, uh, they bought uh, aircraft Cordonia from Germany. But this air, air, air uh, uh, pilot um, had a brother at the same school as me. And what he used to do was to fly into school with his helicopter and <laughs> deliver groceries to his brother. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, when you look back, and this is probably uh, an abuse of, uh, of, uh, of state of But what fascinated me was this was a young man, a Malawian young man, who was flying a helicopter. And it occurred to me that this was something special, you know. Uh, how did he get there? Could I get there? So, at that point, I made up my mind that I was going to join the uh, armed forces and I was going to fly one of the aircraft. <laughs> and that was my goal. So uh, when I moved on to Kamuza Academy, um, that was my ambition. Uh, we had a very good library, well stocked, and in the library we had books about aircraft. And I read every single book of them, and I knew the dashboard of uh, Boeing 707 in those days, and I could really tell you uh, from memory where, what instrument was where. And because that was my passion. But as life has it, it didn't turn out to be like that. I was sick um, for about six months with uh, osteomyelitis, and uh, I became very ill, lost a lot of weight. Uh, just imagine when you have um, a bad cold, the way you feel, you know, sweaty, uh, night sweats, you know, you're aching all over. And that's what I felt for six months. So uh, the clinic eventually uh, sent me to come to Central Hospital uh, to see a visiting orthopedic surgeon, an old man who came in from the States. Uh, I remember I went on a Wednesday with uh, the nurse from the clinic. Um, so we saw the orthopedic surgeon, he said to me, mm, my friend, uh, you need surgery tomorrow. So I said, no, I cannot have surgery tomorrow because on Monday I'm setting my power levels. So he said, well, young man, the choice is, uh, is yours. If you don't have surgery, you'll lose that leg. So all I can advise you is you should have surgery. So I said, I'm not having surgery, I'm going back to school. So the nurse said to me, mm, I think you should think you should think about this and you should have surgery. Eventually they spoke to the school. Um, and they said I could do my exams in the school clinic if I had surgery, and I had surgery the following day. I woke up on Friday, and I felt a lot, lot better. It was just transformation overnight. And at that point, I just made up my mind that this man has made me feel so good, I want to do the same to somebody else for the rest of my life. That's when I changed my mind. my direction. And for me, that was an epiphany, uh, because it was a calling for me uh, to take up medicine as well in my career. So I did go into medicine. I was in Zimbabwe. Um, and some of you will remember Professor Samaji, who was a uh, uh, you know, professor at college here. He taught me uh, anatomy and uh, histology. He was so strict, but he was an excellent teacher. So here I was, uh, you know, trying to memorize the blood vessels in this skull. Um, and trying to look at a book, but it was, it was amazing. But what really changed my life during that time was that this was when HIV was getting hold of this region. We were seeing a lot of uh, uh, patients with TB who were HIV infected, and a lot of deaths as well uh, uh, in the hospital. So I began to say, what can we do about this? Or why is this happening? And I would come to Malawi during my holidays and join uh, Professor Jack Berima and uh, Professor Tony Harris uh, at that time on the ward rounds uh, on the medical ward at Hamilton Hospital. And we see the same thing. But these two men were so exceptional uh, in their practice of medicine uh, and their thinking that I say I will do medicine for the rest of my life. Uh, and Tony Harris and, and Jack Berima really shaped my direction in terms of choosing which specialty I was going to do. 
But the experience of dealing with uh, HIV infected individuals who were dying from uh, TB was really de defining more in terms of what I was going to do uh, uh, for my research career. So when I moved to Liverpool to do my postgraduate training, Bertis, who I had already met in Malawi because I worked with him as his uh, senior house officer at the Central Hospital, uh, connected me up uh, with uh, you know, the research group in Liverpool. And Terry Taylor and uh, uh, Professor Marco Molyneux uh, were presenting at uh, one of the IMS scientific meetings uh, in Liverpool at the time. So I visited uh, one of their presentations. Uh, they were talking about you know, the phantoscopy changes in the eye in kids with uh, cerebral malaria. And as, as I was listening to Terry speak, I say, Terry is doing this work in Malawi? How is it possible to be able to do this kind of work in Malawi? And then I got interested, and I spoke to Bertie uh, after the, uh, that talk. Is this possible? Can I do research in Malawi? So Bertie said, let's talk to uh, Peter Winstanley. And obviously, those who know Peter Winstanley, he's a great guy. So Peter said, well, we can talk about this. Actually, I met a guy uh, who you might be interested to meet. And the guy that Peter had met at a meeting, uh, uh, in, I think it was in South Africa, was David Russell. Uh, because I'd say, I want to do something on TB, uh, and especially understanding the immunology of TB in the lab. I want to know why people with HIV are prone to TB infections. <coughs> so, I wrote to Debbie, uh, explaining to him what I wanted to do, and Debbie was very generous. He said, oh yeah, no, I, I can host you in my lab uh, when you're ready. So, Peter and Bertie uh, really helped me to put together a Welcome Trust Training Fellowship. Um, and like, you know, uh, Stephen said, I was one of the first Africans to get a training fellowship at the same level as a UK or EU student uh, who wanted to do, uh, uh, you know, wanted to, to do a Wacom Trust training fellowship. That was a bit of a problem in the uh, Wacom Trust to decide what I was going to have, but eventually they say I could have a training fellowship like, like everybody else. So I got that, uh, and I came back to, to Malawi uh, to do my training fellowship. But during that time, I remembered what uh, uh, Professor Marco Mullen used to say to me, that if you want to do research and you're doing clinical research, you should ask yourself, what is it that you want to address? You cannot just focus on research uh, when you're a clinician. You should always entertain that clinical bit of you because that's what will inform your research ideas and that's what will inform the direction of your research and focus. And I borrowed this slide from Malcolm because I think it actually explains very well uh, what a lot of clinicians who are doing research do. So, um, so the clinical practice is really critical uh, in informing what you do for research. But in the process, you are also involved in training. And I think this is very, very true uh, in our setting here where a lot of young people who are going through some form of training are also exposed to uh, research activity uh, in the hospital uh, or here at MOW, uh, which also informs their practice. And there are so many examples. I mean, you talk about Rota virus vaccine this, uh, story, pneumococcal vaccine story, uh, salmonella story, HIV self-testing. All those uh, are good examples of how research inform, or how clinical practice informs research and therefore informs training as well. So, now I can move on to some of the science. So, remember that I told you that what drove me into research was the dying uh, that was happening in HIV infected individuals who, were HIV, uh, who, who had TB. And the situation actually hasn't changed very much. Well, it has changed a lot, but you know, it hasn't really normalized in those, uh, in those individuals uh, who are HIV positive because they're still you know, prone to developing TB. Uh, and if you look at the data, uh, once you're HIV infected, your risk of developing active TB starts to rise very early on uh, uh, during the course of HIV infection. And obviously, uh, the longer you have untreated HIV, uh, the greater the risk of developing active TB. But even when you have uh, received antiretroviral therapy, even for a long time with a good CD4 cell count, you just still, you're still at uh, risk of developing active TB, which tells us that you, know, you are not able to reconstitute your immunity in the mind. Uh, to a level where you're protected from active disease. Now the question is, why is that happening? Well, a lot of TB is acquired through the lungs uh, because it's an airborne infection. You breathe in. So the lung is actually a critical organ uh, in transmission uh, of TB, but also in reception of that infection. But if you talk of immunity in the lung, uh, there are two types of cells that are critical uh, for control of TB. The first one, which is the major uh, the major type of cell is the uh, macrophages, 
which are the cells that really capture the TB and try to control that infection before it goes uh, any further. Uh, the other group is uh, the T cells, which again help the macrophages to control that infection. And we envisage that you know, what is happening probably in individuals who are HIV infected is that they have dysfunction of both types of cells, but also the environment in which these cells are, are, are found. Another important point is that both cells, the macrophages and the T cells, are also cells that are infected with HIV. So probably HIV infects both cells, alters their immunity, and then predisposes people to uh, recurrent uh, chest infections, particularly um, TB. So a lot of you who also know Liz Corbett, what Liz has been working on is trying to control TB uh, transmission, especially at that level in the community. What I'm talking about is trying to understand what is happening once somebody is infected, the infection has gone into the lungs, how does it get hold of the cell? And if it's going to progress, how does it progress beyond uh, that cell to cause infection and active disease? So that's, that's where I focused my work and my group. Um, so we, we envision that probably uh, for somebody uh, to develop TB, uh, you know, uh, HIV is destroying the function of the cells called T cells uh, in the lungs. Uh, just like it does in the blood, or it's altering the function of these cells, the macrophages, especially when they're infected with both uh, TB and HIV, or it may be that these cells, uh, the macrophages, when they're infected with HIV, they become more permissive uh, the infection with, uh, with TB. And our focus is to try and understand what is happening uh, when you have dual infection in one cell, uh, or when you have an avian macrophage that is infected with TB, but in the presence of HIV. So when I started this work uh, back in 2000, uh, we set up the clinical investigation unit. Um, and you know, uh, David Russell and uh, Ondwani uh, have been partners and collaborators for a very long time. But probably the longest uh, has been uh, Sister Mahabla, who you know, I recruited back in 2000. And she's still working with me up to now. And we have such a special working relationship that you know, she, she really guides me uh, in the uh, endoscopy unit. But over the 18 year period, I mean, we've done tremendous numbers of endoscopy. And as you know, uh, uh, that unit has serviced a lot of projects Jerry's projects, here, Stephen's projects, uh, and others who have used that unit. So it's a great resource uh, for, for, this, uh, for this institution. But one thing that I've learned uh, throughout this period is that I cannot always go to Stephen or Neil to say, this is the bit of kit that I want to be able to do my science uh, to the best of my ability. I have to take the initiative to find my own money because Neil will tell me, tough mate, I cannot give you 400000 to buy a cell sorter because I haven't got that, I've got other priorities. And I understand that because I'm not the only researcher here. So our strategy over the last uh, decade has been to be able to generate our own income through grants and buy the pieces of equipment that we think who advance our science and make us very competitive at the international stage. So a lot of the equipment that you see here, uh, all the uh, endoscopy equipment uh, was my grant equipment from the Wacom Trust. We had a few tasks to get that, but you know, we got to sorry, 8,000 to buy that equipment. The cell source is an equipment you know, worth $400,000. Uh, that was funded by Gates. Uh, and again, we argued with Gates that we needed that, but we got that. So the first atomometer, we had to tell Rope that we needed that in our, uh, you know, in our core grant. Uh, renewal and you know so you, you, you choose and you, you, you should be quite aware of what it is that you need to move forward and be competitive at international, at international stage instead of waiting for the institution to always provide for you because it will not provide for, for your every need. In addition to that, um, in collaboration with uh, you know David Russell, we have worked out strategies or techniques that we think are novel and have advanced our science beyond what everybody else has been doing uh, in the past. So I spent a, a year in David's lab developing this asset for detection of HIV in infected cells, but also uh, David has developed these uh, reported TB uh, strains that we are now using here in the lab to try and characterize what TB is doing uh, at a neuromacrophage level and what HIV is doing uh, uh, in cells from the lab. So when you're thinking of competing at the international stage, I think you have to choose your strategy very well get the momentum that will help you to be competitive, and find ways uh, of trying to find uh, that kind of, that kind of uh, work. So it's through that work that we've been able to generate data like this. Uh, we've shown that you know, uh, in HIV-infected individuals, uh, you have impairment of uh, the function of the cells called the macrophages that I talked about. Uh, and even when they go on to antiretroviral therapy, 
that function does not get back to normal until about four years into antiretroviral viral therapy. The same happens uh, for the T cells. You do not recover the numbers of the T cells until about four years uh, into antiretroviral viral therapy treatment. But what is particular about the T cells is that you do not recover the full function of these cells even after that time. And this is particularly important because uh, if you look at people who are HIV infected on antiretroviral therapy, I showed you that uh, their risk of developing TB is still high. That risk, however, goes down if you put people on isonized prophylaxis, which is what WHO recommends. But if you give them isonized prophylaxis for, say, six months, nine months, uh, or a year and stop, that protection actually goes away. And that is really supported by the fact that you are not recovering the full function of these cells. So, these data actually have been uh, critical uh, in supporting the current WHO recommendation uh, to put people who are HIV positive studying antiretroviral uh, uh, therapy on TB prophylaxis uh, for the rest of their life uh, as long as they're taking antiretroviral uh, therapy. And now there's good grounds for supporting that data, uh, that, that recommendation. We've also, we've also shown that the environment in which these cells are uh, is completely uh, dysregulated because of HIV. So this is looking at uh, soluble mediators of immunity uh, in somebody who is HIV uninfected. Uh, and all you have to notice is that you know uh, things look normal here. But if you look at somebody who is HIV as HIV infected but not on antiretroviral therapy, there's a big chunk of those soluble mediators uh, that are not available. If they go on to antiretroviral therapy, it recovers, but the recovery doesn't take them back to what they were uh, compared to somebody who is HIV uh, uninfected. Um, so that, that really tells you that HIV is knocking out a big component of that immune response uh, in the lung and therefore predisposing people to uh, you know, uh, persistent infections or recurrent infections. But we also know that you know, antiretroviral therapy leads to immune recovery, and if you look at the uh, recovery of uh, uh, CD4 uh, counts in the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, suppression of HIV viral load in the peripheral blood, uh, in individuals who are HIV uh, infected, uh, you'd expect that when they go into antiretroviral therapy, they should become undetectable. But if you look at persistence of HIV in the alveolar cells, it persists even in individuals who are on antiretroviral therapy. So suppression of virus in the peripheral line does not mean that you're clearing the virus completely in cells in the lungs. That has got implications because uh, if you have persistent virus in the lung, it can cause inflammation and predispose people uh, to uh, you know, recurrent infections. Um, so this is the same object. So we, we've now shown that you can actually isolate virus uh, from these lung cells. I mean, this is HIV body, and these are samples that you know we collected here in the bronchoscopy suite, uh, and I've been able to demonstrate that. So we, we know this virus there. Uh, so either the actual virus or its proteins are, are messing up the environment, immune environment in the lung, and therefore we're disposing people to recurrent infections. Is this important? Of course it is important, because then you can ask a question, why is HIV persisting in these macrophages? And does this persistence actually have an implication on what happens uh, to these individuals? And one way that we've demonstrated this is that we know that HIV-infected macrophages actually do not die. But when CD4 T cells are infected with HIV, they die quite quickly. And the question is, why are these cells not dying when they're HIV-infected when their counterparts, the CD4 T cells, are, are, you know, are, are not, are not are, are dying so quickly? And this is work that uh, was done in, in David Russell's lab in Cornell. Um, they screened uh, 90 uh, long and coding RNAs. And, and these are the uh, you know, proteins that are involved in regulating cell function. To cut a long story short, uh, one of these long encoding RNAs, uh, called SAF, was highly expressed uh, in cells that were infected with HIV, uh, either in vivo, but also in cells that we collected here in Malawi from HIV infected individuals. Um, and we know that the function of SAF, SAF is to protect the cell and prevent cell death, uh, natural cell death. So it does seem as as though SAF is protecting the HIV infected cells from death while not affecting any cells that are surrounding you. So the bystander cells or cells that are not infected with HIV. Uh, so this, these are the data basically from Malawi showing that you have you know, of expression of uh, uh, SAF in those cells that are uh, isolated from individuals who are HIV uh, infected. The relevance of this, however, is that if you block SAF, you do induce that uh, cell death. So if you use uh, uh, the uh, small inhibitor RNA to block the activity of SAF, these cells do go into apoptosis and die. And the dying process actually also results in the death of HIV. And this is actually important because uh, 
potentially this could be a therapeutic avenue for clearing virus uh, HIV from uh, latently uh, infected cells. Um, if you can deliver uh, a compound that will target uh, SAF, then the, in theory, you should be able to get rid of the HIV infected cells uh, from host body compartments. And this is an area that we are exploring uh, with, uh, with great interest. So finally, uh, I'll conclude the science uh, by showing you what we're doing now uh, with respect to TB. And we are using HIV um, as a way of understanding what goes wrong uh, in the lab uh, to predispose people to uh, uh, active TB. So the questions we're asking now are, if somebody is infected with uh, TB, what determines progression to active disease? How do they develop symptoms of active TB? And what does HIV do uh, to the lung cells uh, to promote this progression of active disease? So the scenario that I'd like to propose to you is that each one of us here uh, probably has very different makeup uh, of cells in the lungs. So um, there are those people who are infected with uh, uh, you know, TB, but are able to resist that infection and they do not develop uh, active disease. It may be that those individuals have got, you know, cells that are less permissive to TB uh, and they're able to control that infection. But there may be some of us in this room uh, who, when infected with TB, uh, our cells are permissive to the infection and we develop uh, active disease. Our interest is, can you change the phenotype of somebody from being susceptible to TB uh, to becoming resistant to TB, either through giving them a vaccine, for example, or giving them uh, you know, other modulators that can enhance the function of immunity in the lung and present them, prevent them from developing active disease. So, the work we're doing now in the lab, which David Nzinza, uh, Aaron Chirambo, before he went to, uh, uh, to Glasgow, and uh, Liz Chimbay will be doing as well, and uh, David Mohambo, is to collect from the viral average. Uh, we infect those uh, cells with uh, uh, the reporter strains that I showed you earlier from David's lab, uh, the TB strains, and then we analyze the cells by flow cytometry uh, in the lab. Um, and I can show you that we're able confidently to uh, infect the cells with TB, and this is something that you know people had a lot of anxiety that setting this up in Africa would be quite dangerous in our setting. But actually, we've done it very well. The, the infections are working very really well, and uh, everything seems to be done quite nicely. So we can infect these cells uh, without any problem. Uh, and using our uh, equipment in the lab, we're able to tell which cells are infected with TB, which cells are infected with TB, uh, and which cells are infected with TB. And the organism is actually actively, uh, you know, producing protein uh, within that cell. So this is where I think our work is going uh, going forward, both on the HIV side and on the TB side. Our aim is to try and understand what it is uh, that the viral macrophage does to control TB or uh, HIV. And can it deliver uh, you know, modulators uh, that will inhibit uh, persistence of HIV within that cell, you know, lead to cell death? Or in the context of TB, uh, modulators that will enhance the function of that cell uh, to lead to control of TB. So I'll fi finally uh, finish off by telling you our plans for developing future abilities. So I brought this slide from uh, 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 Rob Heidemann, and I think it demonstrates very well uh, what, you know, uh, as a group we are doing uh, in developing uh, uh, leaders. Uh, so the group currently has people from uh, undergraduates and we've hosted students from high school uh, several times uh, over the past two years, but we have interns as well. Uh, but those people want to progress through various stages uh, and the idea is to have them as principal investigators. At the moment, we have a lot of, well, not a lot, but quite a few individuals who are going through uh, MSc training, uh, uh, a couple of people who are going through PhD training uh, as well. And we believe, and I'm sure I am also uh, attest to this, that we've been very, very active uh, in uh, encouraging our young people to apply for grants, either uh, Commonwealth, uh, Shepling, and our success rate has actually been uh, tremendous over the last over the last two years. Um, so we do this collectively as a group. So the immunology people, uh, me, Kuzwayo, and, and, and Konvani, have agreed that for us to be productive, we need to work as a team. Uh, we do all our meetings together. And I think that actually has given us a lot of strength uh, as, as a cluster as such. Um, all our students, uh, our research assistants work together. Uh, you know, our meetings uh, are together. Um, although our foresight might be different, but we have you know, cooperation in what we do. 
And that has really been beneficial to uh, every single of the three groups. A good example is um, these three ladies. Um, so, Alinane, she's a clinician, she joined Congress group uh, three years ago from Anyo. Um, Liz uh, was in my group. Uh, we got scholarships for them last year uh, through BioTrust. They went to Glasgow. The two ladies came back with distinctions uh, in, uh, in immunology. Uh, Chikondi, most of you know Chikondi here, uh, joined uh, us about two and a half years ago. Uh, Chikondi has won several prizes uh, in her presentations at international meetings uh, on her award. So I, I personally believe that uh, we have a lot of talent that is unexplored. If you give people a chance uh, and if you nurture them to develop that talent, they will show you what they can do. And I think an institution like this has that responsibility uh, to its young people. Uh, irrespective of where they come from in the world, but we have got that responsibility to nurture them and let them develop their full potential. My focus has changed a bit, or has broadened a bit, not changed, because I'm still interested in developing um, the basic scientists, but I think the clinicians are lagged behind uh, in science. And if you look at the number of clinician scientists in the world, it's really, really certainly in Africa, uh, it's very, very small. So about two years ago, I made a decision that I was going to develop this uh, as much as I can. Um, and we have several people now in the, uh, in the group. I mean, David Hango uh, is doing a clinical PhD fellowship uh, with me. Melanie is doing an MN uh, uh, part with, with me as well. Vanessa, who you know, has done, or is doing an MN. She's now in Bristol. But all these are doing projects here at MYW as part of their MN because they're interested in doing research as well. Um, Gloria is very unique because she's the first nurse to get an MSc scholarship uh, from the Commonwealth. She's now at uh, University College London doing an MSc in stroke medicine. And this will boost our uh, endeavor to study HIV-related uh, vascular diseases. Um, so Gloria and Johanne, who has just completed a similar uh, master's fellowship uh, at UCL, and will be coming back hopefully uh, sometime uh, this month or next month. Uh, are unique people because they're developing uh, the strong beat of uh, HIV complications that we want to focus on. And Jackie, uh, again, pre-PhD fellow, uh, uh, wanting to study uh, cardiovascular effects of HIV. Uh, and Stephen uh, joined me because he's interested uh, in looking at uh, drugs for TB uh, for new modulators of uh, immunity in the lung to enhance uh, TB treatment. So, I think one thing that we've done really well is to exploit new avenues for attracting young people to science. Uh, and Conrad was really, really great in developing this uh, Science for All uh, program, which in my view is, is one of the best in terms of uh, attracting young people uh, to science. And he's, um, he's gone all around southern region uh, to get young people to be interested in science. And over the last uh, two years, we've had a lot of uh, people, young yeah, students from secondary schools joining us. Uh, to spend time in the lab, uh, you know, sh five weeks, uh, two months, three months, which has been really great. But I think the, for me, the final message that I want to put across to you is that if you're going to develop science here in Malawi, uh, then for me, induce is the, way for, is the way forward. We have to be able to identify the talent that is out there. <coughs> because it is out there. And when you do identify that talent, you should nurture it. And that nurturing process also involves developing that talent. And once you've developed it, unleash it. Don't stand in their way. Let them do what they're good at doing. You can guide them, but don't stand in their way. Unleash that talent. But when you're unleashing that talent, create a conducive environment. And places like MYW, College of Medicine, John Hopkins, uh, or Better Malaria Project are the fascinating places to do that. People who are skilled or well-trained, when you give them room uh, to show you what they can do, they will show you what they can do. Uh, and I think we should be able to do that. In my group here at the MOW, there are a lot of young people who, when you let them go to do whatever they do, I mean, people like Dumi set up the CL3 lab uh, without me having to do most of the work myself. So people who are talented uh, are keen to show you what they're able to do. So, how are we, are we going to move forward? Our vision moving forward uh, is that, you know, I would like us to be a set of excellence uh, uh, in infection and uh, non communicable disease immunology. Uh, in the region, uh, uh, and you know, possibly uh, in, in, in a low-income income country. But I cannot, you know, 
say that's the only vision because Stephen is going to slap my wrist if I don't also include that then what they really aims to do, which is you know to conduct excellent science. And that's exactly what we want to do. But in addition to that, we want to uh, train the next generation uh, of uh, 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 scientists. My, my view uh, is that we, we are going to do that. Um, we, we should focus on the quality uh, of the science that we do and what impact it will have. But also uh, make sure that our training portfolio uh, is able to deliver on what we want to do. And obviously, you want to create a research environment that is conducive in terms of uh, uh, the infrastructure that you need, but also uh, uh, the expertise that you need for people to thrive and deliver uh, for, uh, on the things that you want to do. But having said all that, I think it's important for me uh, and for my group that we enhance the image of MOW, College of Medicine, and Malawi uh, as a country where people should want to come and do research because that's where you do the best immunology research, for example. If you want to do lung immunology research, go to Malawi because they've got the best center. That's what we're aiming for. Uh, and I think, you know, to some extent, uh, in, in Africa, I think we probably are achieving that, uh, that position because there are a number of people who come here uh, are more interested to do research with us. And obviously, we have to set ourselves uh, uh, you know, uh, targets uh, to judge ourselves whether we're achieving this or not. Um, and I've just listed some of the things here. I mean, Stephen is really interested to see what our publications are like. Uh, Neil will be interested in what our grants are like. Um, but you know, we are interested in whether we are actually advancing science uh, or not, uh, because that is uh, a critical thing for us. And our students, oh yes, uh, you have to have students who are achieving the targets that you set them. And you want to attract them back here. You do not want to train students and lose them completely so that they don't come back here. And we have had a good record here. I mean, Devin since I went to Germany, but he came back because he knows that he can only do his best science here, uh, although exposure outside is great. So I'll finish by saying thank you so much. Uh, I've got a lot of people to thank, especially our study participants uh, who were generous to about the bronchoscopies and various things. I cannot uh, forget uh, to thank you know, uh, Rob, who was really instrumental in helping us to send it back uh, when I came back from, from the UK, and various other people from Davis Lab, Davis Lab who have helped us in our experiments. Um, I've got a fantastic uh, clinical team uh, led by Sister Mahamba, uh, and you know, of all these young people, Ralph was in uh, uh, Glasgow, he came back with his masters, uh, Lizzie came back with her masters. Um, Andrew uh, came back from Nairobi, uh, he's not with us anymore, but uh, uh, you know, Leonard uh, went off to London uh, yesterday or at the weekend uh, to do his master's in immunology, and Joseph is going off to uh, Glasgow to do his master's in immunology, so has Aaron. So three have gone, but three have come back as well. So we are maintaining that, you know, efflux, but influx as well of people who are trained to take over uh, the work that we're doing. Could do all this without the support of uh, our funders, uh, especially uh, the Wellcome Trust, MRC, um, who have been really generous uh, in getting us to uh, be able to do the science that we do. Uh, and I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you.